For many, the 1970s were the pinnacle of musical creativity in the West. Following the brief but revolutionary era of the Beatles, a whole new realm of possibilities had been uncovered, with more and more artists deciding to experiment both stylistically and technically. Suddenly, genres like pop, rock, jazz and world music were no longer separated, but could be blended and fused at will, without fears of commercial failure. In particular, technological developments in music production enabled sounds and textures that no one thought possible outside of orchestral, big-budget composition. No piece embodies this period of inspiration and ingenuity better than Mike Oldfield's debut album, Tubular Bells, from 1973. Written when he was still a teenager, the composition takes up two sides of an LP, with a runtime of over 49 minutes in total, and featuring over 16 instruments, most of which Oldfield played himself. The album single-handedly launched Richard Branson's Virgin Records, and thanks to its inclusion in the soundtrack of The Exorcist, it soon achieved international acclaim and success, making Oldfield's fortune before he'd even turned 21. But despite its quick composition and stress-free production, the piece is by no means a product of a contented mind. When he came to record the album, he was in a terrible state, a result of a turbulent childhood and adolescence, but it was this state that nevertheless informed and fueled his creativity. The product of this is an immersive, psychologically and emotionally affecting work that takes a listener into a fully realised world of sounds, moods and genres. Although not coming from a particularly musical family, Oldfield was inspired to pick up a guitar by his father and his rudimentary playing skills, teaching himself everything beyond the four basic chords that his dad passed on. But his mother's intense depression and subsequent barbiturate addiction following a complicated pregnancy left him traumatised at a young age. The difficulties encountered by the family led him to further immerse himself in music, and in the coming years, he would use the medium as an outlet to channel his anxiety and restlessness. After leaving school at 15, he joined his sister Sally to form the other half of Sally Angie, a folk duo, having gained experience by gigging in pubs and at folk festivals at a young age. But, following the release of their lone album, Children of the Sun, Oldfield suffered a nervous breakdown, believed to be linked to a negative experience with LSD, which would take years to recover from. He was then taken on by psychedelic rock musician Kevin Ayers to serve as a bassist for his band The Whole World, despite not playing bass himself at the time. During his time with the group, Oldfield participated in the recording of three albums taking place at the world-famous Abbey Road Studios. Between recordings, he made use of the wide range of instruments available to them, which he taught himself to play, just as he had with the guitar. And so, while working for other artists, he began to develop a demo reel of his own material, known at the time as Opus One, but which would eventually be called Tubular Bells. The opening, and the most famous part of the piece, consists of a repeated piano riff in the key of A minor. The melodic range of the pattern is relatively simple, extending to a D at most, but always returning to a repeated E as a sort of launch point. It bears some resemblance to Bach's Staccata. Where did that tune come from? Oh, well, it's Bach's Staccata. It's the upside down version of that. See? There you go. Bach, along with more recent orchestral composers like Bartok and Stravinsky, was a source of inspiration for Oldfield at the time, but Tubular Bells' main influence has to be minimalist pioneer Terry Riley. His composition, A Rainbow in Curved Air, from 1969, sees an electric organ play a repeated riff in 7-8, a highly irregular time signature, with multiple melody lines being introduced thanks to multi-track recording. Oldfield also chooses to set his melody to an irregular rhythm, going one step further than Riley by spreading it across two different time signatures. One phrase consists of seven beats in a bar, while the next unfolds across eight. This makes it hard for the listener to identify a consistent pulse because the stressed beats keep occurring at inconsistent distances from each other. The phrase is repeated with the addition of a far feeser organ and set of toy bells increasing the texture and providing harmonic context for the melody. He achieved this layered effect thanks to a double track recording setup, as Riley did with Rainbow. The melody's insistence has an obsessional quality, and simultaneously captures a melancholy and highly focused mood, like a thought that needs to be worked through. With this as a starting point, he hoped to eventually create a long-form instrumental piece in the vein of the experimental jazz rock group Centipede's four-part composition, 
Septober energy. Although it's far more avant-garde than tubular bells, deliberately achieving cacophony more than harmony or consonants, and leaning heavily into improvisational jazz as opposed to careful orchestration, it does create a palpable sense of atmosphere and scale through the sheer number of instruments and musicians, which Oldfield also manages. The addition of electric guitars into tubular bells is arguably what warrants labelling as progressive rock, although only a few sections could definitively be described as rock themselves. Oldfield also places orchestral instruments into the foreground. Following sections are led by a flute, acoustic guitar, a set of tubular bells, of course, and a honky-tonk piano. That last one was included as a tribute to Oldfield's grandmother, who used to play in pubs as a young woman. The broad range of instruments helps to achieve a sense of scale and grandeur, despite the modest budget needed to record the piece. While other progressive musicians were also experimenting with sonority at the time, groups like Genesis and Jethro Tull would frequently incorporate the flute into their music. Oldfield's use of multi-track recording allowed him complete control over the orchestration, and with the aid of technology, he could also transform the sound of the guitar into that of a mandolin or even bagpipes. We can also see a classical approach to composition through Oldfield's use of the main motif. As with the form of a theme and variations, the melody is repeated, chopped up and altered, appearing in both lead and backing lines throughout the first side. His approach to instrumentation is also pretty orchestral. The final eight minute section of side one, for example, plays out like an updated version of a young person's guide to the orchestra, as each instrument is introduced over a repeating bass line announced by a master of ceremonies, Viv Stanchel of the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. It's here that the piece gets its name, when Stanchel triumphantly announces Plus, bells. The first side wraps up nicely with a simple acoustic guitar part playing an altered version of the opening theme, as that obsessive, irregular and unsettled melody finally gets put at ease this time in a major key and a regular time signature. It's as if through repetition, it's been worked through, like a depression or lingering thought, which for Oldfield, it probably was. The second side consists of fewer distinct sections, and ironically lacks both tubular bells and the main theme that was so crucial to the first half. Instead, what holds this side together, for the most part, is a mood and theme. We begin with clean electric guitars, playing layered ostinati. The first pattern is six quavers long, while the second is twelve, allowing for some animated but regular phrasing as the two neatly overlap. However, the third, carried by the bass, doesn't fit so easily, as it consists of thirty-three quavers. This produces what's called phasing, a staple of minimalist avant-garde composition used by composers like John Cage and Steve Reich, as can be seen in his suitably named Piano Phase from 1967, where two piano lines play the same melody, but they grow gradually apart. The phasing on side two occurs when the melodies of different lengths overlap, with the stressed beats of the melodies only coinciding with one another every 12 bars. This third, irregular melody sounds familiar, despite its odd length, and that's because it's actually the second, just rhythmically augmented or stretched. Why does Oldfield decide to do this? Here's my theory. Side 2 in general is far more folky, stylistically, than the first, with its melodies generally using modes or scales typically associated with folk music, and the side and the piece even ends with a jovial rendition of Sailor's Hornpipe, giving part 2 more of a sea shanty feel. Then, if we consider the album cover, putting aside the metallic object that symbolises the tubular bells used on side 1, we can trace this maritime theme of side 2 to the imagery of the seashore. To stretch even further, I'd say that these irregular overlapping melodies from the beginning of side 2 represent waves lashing the shoreline. There's absolutely no evidence, aside from what I've mentioned to prove that this was Oldfield's intention, but it does fit into his philosophy about music. That's what I like when I listen to a piece of music, I like to put it on and to just, just float off into a different world, you know, and that's why a long-form piece of instrumental music is ideal for that. 
Once we've had several rounds of these overlapping melodies, the piece then settles into the second one, picking a 3-4 time signature that allows a chorus of guitars and organs into a shared pulse. Again, if you wanted to read into it, you could read this as a boat finally entering calmer waters. Developing from this relatively calm section of the piece, the folk element then gets intensified as distorted electric guitars play a distinctly maritime theme over top of driving timpani. Interestingly, Oldfield seemed to have intended this section as the defining part of the whole album, with the melody being adapted into its own single, known as Theme from Tubular Bells, instead of the widely known Exorcist theme. Taking the maritime storm theory further, we can see something of a discernible thematic structure. Having set off from the gentle shoreline, and then drifting through a more regular ocean voyage theme, we soon enter a ferocious storm. This extended sequence, known as Caveman, is the most aggressive part of Side 2, and the strangest of the whole piece. Here we see a drum kit enter for the first time, along with the traditional rock ensemble, and infamously, the titular growling lunatic. Of all the sections, it probably fits the least well, partly because it was actually written as its own piece while Oldfield was working with Kevin Ayers. The caveman vocals were not originally planned by Oldfield, unlike the rest of the project, but rather came after Richard Branson foolishly suggested he had some vocals to make the album more commercially appealing. In response, the drunken Oldfield spent a few hours screaming into a microphone, recording at double speed to produce a lower tone when played back normally. Wrapping up the piece, excluding the tacked on Sailor's Hornpipe arrangement, is a calming and atmospheric blend of electric guitars and a far feaser organ, lingering in a minor tonality before finally resolving into the tonic major, neatly tying up the work in a triumphant but understated way, as the ocean storm has passed and we've entered calmer waters once again. Across its 49 minute runtime, Tubular Bells takes us on an odyssey of musical sounds and styles through the mind of an anxious genius. I was so focused and I put all my concentration, all my energy, emotional, spiritual, physical even, into it. And it all comes out in, in that music. Its pure creativity and vision has given it a life beyond the two sides of that best-selling LP and it remains one of the most important compositions in the history of modern music.